All right, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. For several weeks now, we've been in a message series called Love Lessons, and we've been talking about very practical ways of getting, getting along with other people. Um, uh, let's face it, relationships are tough, and sometimes they're sticky and messy, and sometimes we would say even frustrating. So what we want to do today is we want to talk about how we are different, and yet how, though different and diverse, we can tolerate one another. And we can come, become united. And, and in this room, I just want to remind you today, in this room, there's an, a, a great amount of diversity here in this room today. There really is. I mean, people from all walks of life, from every level of maturity of life, there are night owls and early birds, right? There are science-minded people, and then there are artistic-minded people. In fact, I've got to tell you a story real quickly. Uh, Mike Timms, Chris Pye, and I, uh, and Dennis Below were at lunch just a couple weeks ago. And we were talking about summer vacations and stuff. And I said, uh, you know, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. And, and Chris is a mechanical engineer. And he said, oh, the Grand Canyon, it's okay, but the Hoover Dam is really neat. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike says, how in the world could you look at God's creation in the great Grand Canyon and say, well, that's okay, but the Hoover Dam is really awesome. <laughs> anyway, Chris, that engineer mind, right? We're different. Uh, there are dog people and cat people, right? You know the difference between a dog and a cat, right? A, a dog says, these people love me, serve me, feed me. Uh, they must be God. The cat, peop- the cat says, these people love me, serve me, feed me. I must be God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the mindset there. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have young people. We have older people. We have different spiritual ages. There are people who became Christians later in life as compared to some of you who, you know, were raised in church. There are people from different religious backgrounds, some irreligious backgrounds, right? We have Baptist and Catholic and Methodist and people who had no church upbringing. It's just an amazing amount of diversity. People, again, from all walks of life. But there's one thing that we have in common, one thing, and that is all of us are people who've been redeemed and changed by the love of God. That's the one thing that brings us together, not only us, but millions of Christians all around the world today are worshiping in the same room. Though diverse, though different, they come together around one purpose and one life-changing truth, and that is God is a God of love, and he has transformed every one of us. Now, you might be surprised to find out, though, that many churches forget that truth. They forget that reality. They forget what brings them together. And they get into a mindset of looking at what makes them different from one another rather than what makes them common with one another. And so now here in Romans chapter 14, a brilliant passage by the Apostle Paul, Paul is going to talk about the amazing diversity that's represented there in the church of Rome, but how these people can get along with one another despite their differences. And how they should not focus on their differences, instead on focus on the things that are more important. So let's read in Romans chapter 14. And by the way, I want to say this. This, relation, this principle today is true in all relationships. We've said this time and time again in this series. This is, you know, the, these are mostly principles that are in the context of the church. But if you will apply these principles today, they will work in your marriage relationship, the work relationships, in your relationships with your children. Let's look at what he says. Verse 1, Romans 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. This is the English Standard Version, okay? There are other translations that will translate that phrase, opinions, will translate that word instead, disputable matters. It could be opinions, preferences. We'll come back to that in just a second. He's saying don't quarrel over those things. Verse 2 One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. Why? Because the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, the Apostle Paul goes on throughout this whole chapter to describe the, the, the differences and the diversity in this particular church and how they can get along with each other. Now, 
the key here is to understand what is he talking about from the standpoint of disputable matters or opinions, okay? What does he mean by that? Uh, that phrase is taken from two words in the original language. The first word meaning differencing, uh, differencing or discriminating. It's a form of judgment is what the Bible is talking about here. It's noticing a difference between myself and another person, but then becoming critical of that difference is the idea. And the second word is the word that means opinions or reasonings or ways that I think is the idea. So the phrase could be, hey, these are the things that I feel, that I believe, that I hold to, that other people don't, and therefore I discriminate against other people because they don't see things the way that I see them. Paul is saying don't fight about those things. In other words, Paul is making a distinction between things in the church that are really important and things in the church that are not. So let me outline it a little bit more clearly for you. What are disputable matters? Number one, they do not concern salvation. In other words, these are not arguments about the nature of Christianity or salvation or whether somebody is a Christian or not. That's not the discussion that's going on here. There are other less important things than that. Secondly, they are not moral or doctrinal essentials. In other words, they're not clearly outlined as moral or doctrinal beliefs. So it's not people disagreeing about lying or cheating or some other clear moral issue that's taught in the scripture. It's not people um, arguing about the nature of who Christ is. The, that's a major argument. That's an important discussion to have. So disputable matters are not those things. They're not essentially moral or doctrinal from the standpoint of their essential nature. And then finally, they are matters of individual preference or opinions. That's really what they are. They're really preferential. There are particular convictions that I have that maybe other people do not have. There are opinions that I have about certain things that other people may or may not have. And Paul is saying here in this church in Rome that there are people who are turning against each other about things that are really not all that important in the big scheme of things. And Paul says, stop it. Paul says, grow up. Paul says, there are some things of which to fight about. But there are other things that you are fighting about that are not worthy of the discussion, that are not worthy of the fight. Now, this is what's going on here. We talk about our diversity in the room. Even much more so was that church having a hard time with the diversity that they had. I mean, in the United States of America, we kind of get this a little bit better than other cultures at other times did. There, in the first century, this was the church in Rome, a metropolitan area, all right? And, of course, Rome was the epicenter of the Greek gods, of the pagan religions. And so what you have here is you have people who are from the Greek religion, the pagan religions, who became Christians. And they're placed into this church with other believers who were different than they were. Because what you have also making up this church are people who were from the Jewish faith. People who understood uh, God in a different way than they did and who were thrown into that same church and that same congregation. And you can imagine they're trying to get along with each other because they're coming from totally different backgrounds. I mean, the Jews, in fact, Paul, in the verses following this, verses 5 through about verse 12, Paul outlines some of those things, and he really talks about two areas that they're fighting about in particular. And this was particularly important for those who were Jews. Two things. Number one was their diet their diet. He talks about abstaining from certain foods or eating certain foods. Well, this was important to the Jew in particular, right? Because those who were part of the Greek religion, they would offer animals on the sacrifice to their God, and then they'd cook that thing up and eat it, right? Well, the Jews said, no way. You should never, ever eat an animal that had been sacrificed to a God, because that would be unspiritual. That would be unholy to do. And so these two groups of folks are thrown into the same church, and they're trying to sort through these things. So you have dietary laws, and then the other big one was special days, special religious holidays, holy days, 
The Jews had certain convictions that certain days were more important than other days. And some of the pagans were like, this day is not all that important. It's just like any other day. So here again, you have opinions and preferences that are going on with people who have different opinions and different preferences. And they're trying to get along, and they're fighting with one another about these things. Now, how does that apply to you and me today? Well, let me just throw out a few examples for you of of ways that churches can kind of turn on each other and and about the disputable matters that that churches will often make very, very important. Music. And I'm not talking about worship music. I'm talking about preferential music that you listen to. (laughs) There are some people who are who are classic rock kind of people who come from a whole different era, right? They love that hard rock stuff. Other people are jazz kind of people. Other people are country. You've got a lot of country people. You have other people say, no, nothing else but Christian music should be listened to, right? Movies, entertainment, television. People have differing opinions about what should be watched and what shouldn't be watched. Certain foods to eat or not eat. Drinking alcohol. People who come out of a background where, you know, you shouldn't drink alcohol. Christians should never, ever drink alcohol. There are those who are more free about drinking alcohol than that, right? So uh, we, we came out of a Southern Baptist tradition when I became a Christian, and, and certainly alcohol was one of those big things, you know. It was just something that you didn't do. You don't, you don't drink, you don't smoke. You, you, and you don't listen to rock music, and you don't date the girls who do. That's, that was the rule. And so a whole different mindset, a whole different background, people thrown into the same congregation. Doctrine. The Bible is clear that there are certain things, certain hills on which we should die doctrinally, certain things that are non-negotiable, that Jesus was the Son of God, the unique Son of God, who was the way for salvation through His atoning death, that this is the Word of God, that men and women are sinners who can only enter into a relationship with God by faith, through grace. Those are key, essential, orthodox Christian principles that must be essential and non-negotiable. So it's not a free-for-all. Paul is not describing a free-for-all here where anything goes. He's not saying that. But he's he's giving us a box. He's he's trying to say, hey, within this box of which the boundaries are morals, of, of which the boundary is doctrine. In other words, you can cross over a line. You can cross a threshold into immorality. You can cross a, a, a threshold into uh, heresy. But Paul says, in that box... And within those boundaries, there are a lot of specific beliefs that are up to the interpretation of the individual that are more opinion and preferential, are more of a personal conviction. And Paul says, listen, you can fight about the boundaries, but don't fight about the disputable matter. And churches are notorious for majoring on the minors, for making the petty really important. And churches are undermined when people do that. And marriages are undermined when people do that. If you've been married for a few years, you know which battles to pick. <laughs> if, you, if you have children that get to a certain age, you've probably learned the hard way. There's some things that you fight about, some things that you confront, the other things you just kind of have to let go of. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about those in the body of Christ who are willing to give up their own special, individual, preferential opinions and give grace to other people who may see things differently than they do. There's all kinds of things that Christians can argue about. Paul says, choose those things really carefully. He's describing two groups of people. He talks about them there in the first five verses. He talks about the weak and the strong, the weak and the strong. Now, in our mindset, we would say, you know, the weak ones are the ones who have more freedom. And the strong ones are the ones who are actually limiting themselves, who say no more than the other people do, who, who abstain. 
It's actually just the opposite of that. Paul says the weak are the ones who have limited themselves. In fact, let's draw a contrast here. The weak, first of all, are characterized by being limited. They have translated their faith into rules and regulations. And they're not to the point where they've really experienced the freedom in Christ to move beyond legalism and to live a life of freedom. And boy, you know what? When I first became a Christian, I was certainly there. And this is part of Paul's point. This is kind of a temporary maturing process for people who have not gotten to a certain point. But when I became a Christian in college, I I mean, I began to make all these rules and regulations that I placed on myself that I thought made me spiritual. I mean, it got to the point where I said, well, after church on Sunday, I will not go to a restaurant to eat at a restaurant because when I go to that restaurant and I eat food in that restaurant, it's causing people who have to work at that restaurant not to be able to go to church. And that was just one little thing. <laughs> I mean, I had, all, I had all these rules lined up, and boy, I was weak in my faith. I had not matured to understand that God was bigger, to understand that there was more freedom. So the weak would be the person who limits themselves, and Paul would say the strong is the person who is more liberated, in their faith. In other words, the strong are those that, that say and understand what, what Paul meant when he said, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Now, they're not bound by legalism and rules and regulations. They've understood Christian freedoms. They've been set free from that. Now, again, please hear me, it's not a free-for-all. There's a threshold that you cross. And, it's, and Paul talks about that in the book of Romans 2. But in essence, it's people who have defined their faith by rules and regulations, the weak, and those who have understood and found freedom in Christ. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. The weak person looks at the strong person. The person who has limited themselves looks at the person who is kind of more free and loose. And they say, just look at how sinful that person is. If they were as spiritual as I was, they wouldn't be doing that. They wouldn't be watching that. They wouldn't be listening to that. If they were as spiritual as I was. And so the weak, what do they do? They judge. They condemn. They say, look at them. They're not spiritual. The strong, what do they do? Well, they look down their noses at those immature, weak ones. And they say, that poor legalist. Look at how much fun they're not having. (laughs) They're a Christian, but they just haven't learned the joy of the Christian life. Look at them. They're not as spiritual as I am. And so the indictment in Romans chapter 14 to both groups is the same. Both are judging each other. And both are fighting with each other. And both are saying, you need to do what I do. You need to believe what I believe about a disputable, unimportant, insignificant matter. And Paul says it's ridiculous. Grow up. And so he has some words. He has some instructions here. To the weak, he says to them, do not demand of your brother or sister what you expect for yourself. Don't make demands upon others to behave as you do or to believe as you do. Don't make demands. Not about these disputable matters. To the strong, he says, do not demean. Don't condescend to them. Don't think you're better than them. Don't look down your nose at them. Don't demean where they are in their walk of faith. Validate where they are. Understand where they are. And help them move from legalism into liberty again not crossing the threshold but finding true freedom in christ i worked in student ministry for many many years and you know you have teenage girls and no offense to teenage girls they have crushes and they get infatuation and they have a little boyfriend maybe for a little bit and then they break up and you know and it's it's drama i mean it's the end of the world for about a week and then (laughs) But during that week, man, it's tough. And, and I've talked to parents every once in a while. They say, oh, well, it's puppy love. And I say, yeah, it's puppy love. But remember, puppy love is real to the puppy. And just because we think they shouldn't have their heart broke, they still have their heart broke. 
that's where they are is the idea. And we can condescend, but nonetheless, Paul is saying, give grace, give understanding, give tolerance to those who are different than you on these disputable matters. Politics is another thing that we can argue about and fight about in the church that are not as important as other things. So he says, to the weak, don't demand. To the strong, don't demean. And then he has some words to both groups, to us all. Let's look at those, and that's how we're going to close out today. In verse 13, look down in verse 13. He says, first of all, consider your brother. Hmm. Consider yourself. Consider what you think. Consider what you believe is right. Get your way. Control people by them believing what you believe about every little thing. No, he says, consider your brother. Look at verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Speaking to both groups now. But rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Paul is saying this. A mature believer is someone who is willing to give up something for the sake of a brother and sister in Christ. Well, I have a right to drink. Yeah, you're free to do so in Christ. But if you're in a public setting and you're with a younger brother and sister in Christ and you know that they find that offensive, Paul says be willing to give that up in that setting, in that particular instance. He says, do not destroy your brother for whom Christ died for the sake of food. Does that make sense? that you would ruin the faith of your brother and sister just because you feel like you have the right to do what you want when you want to do it? Consider your brother. Secondly, verse 14, he says, be true to your conscience. Look at what he says. I know, and Paul is someone who's found freedom, right? I know, and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. In other words, that day is not particularly irreligious it's not unclean that food is not unclean just because it's been sacrificed to an idol i mean there's not something in there's not demons in the texture of the meat paul's saying that's not unclean he says i know that i'm persuading the lord that that that's not but look at what he says but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean what an amazing practical word of wisdom here Again, puppy love is real to the puppy. So to the person who in their conscience feels that something that they're being tempted to participate in is wrong to do, then for that person it is wrong to do it. In fact, it would be a sin and it would be a violation for them to do something that they inherently feel that is wrong. But here's Paul's point. The thing that you might inherently feel in your conscience is wrong to do, somebody else might not feel that same way. For you, don't do it. For that person, don't judge them. Let their conscience be their guide. Because why? Because each stands or falls, not to you. Each stands or falls to the Lord. Each is accountable to God. Your brother or sister is not accountable to you. (laughs) Not ultimately. Ultimately, it's to God. So be true to your conscience. What is wrong for you to do, stick with that. Believe that. And don't sin in it. Then look in verses 15 through 18. Don't major on the minors. Look at what Paul says. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. That's what I just said. Verse 16. So do not let what you regard as good to be spoken of as evil. Now here's the give and take. Because Paul is saying, listen, the weak want to look at you and you're doing something. They're going to say what you're doing is evil. Paul says, don't let them label you like that. Don't let them speak of what you're doing as evil. No, have the security within yourself that it's not evil. It's okay. In other words, don't come under a false guilt or a false condemnation just because you're doing something that you feel free to do, but your brother and sister might think that you're not free to do it. Be okay with it. But then look at what he says, verse 17. Here's the major. For the kingdom of God, that's the major, and here's the minor, is not a matter of eating and drinking, but what? Of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. 
Wow. Don't major on the minors. It says the kingdom of God is not about eating certain foods. It's not about special days. It's not about what is material and what is physical. The kingdom of God is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Don't major on the minors. Next, make peace a priority. Verse 19, so then, here's kind of the therefore. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Let us chase after those things, not after the other things that destroy the unity in the body of Christ. Let us focus on, let us give our attention to, let us give our efforts to the things that actually build peace and mutual edification. And then finally, in verses 20 through 23, Paul says, listen, whatever you practice, whether you're weak, strong, whatever it is, whatever you practice, do so in faith. Verse 20, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Do you know how many churches have been split apart by focusing and fighting about petty, unimportant things? The work of God has been destroyed time and time again about things that don't matter a hill of beans. Paul says, don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. I was reading a few months ago about a church that had a two and a half hour business meeting about what kind of folding chairs to buy for the fellowship hall and the church was fighting about it is what this article and there were some who wanted a certain folding chair and others who wanted a certain other folding chair and they brought in an orthopedic doctor to give testimony about which chair would be more ergonomic two and a half hours talking about folding chairs and Satan all along is just laughing and saying, how great is it that I've, I've diverted this church in such a way that they're, they're talking about and arguing about this thing that is so petty and that is so important. The color of the paint in the bathroom and the kind of carpet and the whatever. Churches have been destroyed because of it. Paul says, don't let that happen. Grow up. Be more mature than that. Look at what he says, everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. (laughs) So Paul is just saying, sometimes you just need to kind of shut it. And, you know, if you have this preference and that kind of thing, don't force that upon other people. Just be quiet. Keep that between yourself and God. That's for you, and that's in your relationship to God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. If you approve of it, and in relationship to Christ you found freedom in it, that's the key. Then don't pass judgment even upon yourself. Be free. Free to restrict yourself if that's what you believe God wants. And free not to abstain. If you find freedom in Christ to do that. Verse 23, the final verse, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now, let me just give you as we close today a really simple rule. This is great for the church and we teach this in our new members class. It's great for the church. It's great for a marriage. Three really simple rules. Number one, in essential beliefs, unity. There are some things that are essential. There are some things that are really not up for negotiation and debate. We outline those pretty clearly here at the Brook. There are eight doctrinal essentials, and they have to do with the nature of salvation, who Jesus was, what the Bible is, all those kinds of things. Those are essential. We will fight about those. And if you become a member of the Brook, you must adhere to and agree to those eight Basic, essential doctrines of our faith. In those things, we've got to have unity. It's not a free-for-all. We come here. In fact, those things identify us. They bring identity to who we are because we believe them strongly and we hold to them fast. In essential beliefs, unity. In non-essential beliefs, diversity. Diversity. These are the disputable matters. Not everybody's going to believe the same things that you do about these interpretable things. 
about these preferential things, that's okay. Your wife is not going to believe the same things about certain things as you do in every matter. Do you get the big things right? Do you get the major things right? Have diversity in the non-essential things. And then finally, in all our beliefs, charity. Charity. That's that old King James word for love. Charity. Show love. Regardless of what people believe. Regardless of where they are. Weak, strong, whatever. Show love. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, If I have all knowledge and all prophecy, if I have all wisdom, if I have faith to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And we are nothing without love. I read a story a few years ago by Max Lucado. He's a really good author. and I was reading this book, and he told a story in the context of that book that was really powerful, and I've always remembered it. He was talking about a time when he and his brother and another friend were going to go on a fishing trip with their father. And so they loaded up the truck and the camper, and they head up into the mountains. It's somewhere where it was kind of colder. Uh, they head up into the mountains, and as they get further and further up the mountain, it gets colder and colder, and as they uh, get to the top, it's raining. So they're there that first night, and it's raining, and they can't go fishing or anything, can't even get out of the camper. So they say, well, that's okay. Tomorrow morning, we'll get up and we'll go fishing. So they sleep through the night. They get up tomorrow morning. It's not only raining, it's sleeting. <laughs> they look out the window, it's sleeting. So Max Locato says that me and my brother and my friend and my dad, we start playing board games because, you know, we're trying to keep other, each other occupied. And he says, we're playing cards and we're playing Monopoly and we're doing this. We look out the window, it's still sleeting. And he says, over time and over those hours, what happened is we began to turn on each other. <laughs> he says, we were cooped up in this camper and we were trying to wait it out but uh, we, got, we became really frustrated and intolerant with each other there in that camper. And they were waiting out for the late afternoon, the evening. And they said, we'll just wait, you know, just a few more hours. And then later on that afternoon, that evening, it's not just sleeting or raining, it's snowing. And so the temperature dropped. It's colder and colder. And they decide they're not going to be able to go fishing. So they, they pack up and they leave and they head back home. And he said this at the end of that story. I've never thought, uh, forgot about it. He said this. He said, I realize that when people don't fish, they fight. Right? Here's, here's the point. And he was talking about the power of purpose. And that when purpose is not clearly defined, people give their attention, their effort, and their energy to something. Make sure it's the right thing. God has called us to be fishers of men. He's called us to fish. Meaning this, that our primary purpose is to grow authentic disciples of Jesus. That's it. It's real clear. It's not rocket science. To grow authentic disciples of Jesus. And when that purpose is not in the forefront, when that purpose does not drive us to be who we are called to be, guess what? Something will replace it. And the things that will replace that mission and that vision are the things that people will often fight about. And so it is so true that when we don't fish, we fight. So we need to fish. We need to stay clear about what's important and what's not important. We need to do that for the church. We need to do that in our marriages. We need to make sure that we understand clearly what God has called us to. Because that purpose is greater than any single individual. And if we will commit ourselves to it, guess what? We will all find a way to get along with one another. Because what matters more is not any individual person and that person getting their way and everybody kind of believing like that person. Instead, what will matter most is what God has set before us in the form of being fishers of men. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father, thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you for the profound wisdom in how practical it is and that you would preserve this piece of text for us from the Apostle Paul, really from you to us, that will help us to get along. And though we are different, that there is power in that difference. It's not a liability. It's really an asset. 
And so help us to come together around our differences, to be unified, to synergize, to experience what it means to really be a team of people who, though different, come together as one. May we be that kind of church, Father. May we understand clearly our purpose. And then help us to have the maturity, Father, to let go of things that really don't matter. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. We're going to have our starting points brunch right here in this room in about four minutes. Thanks.